Every time I whack this on the recording, it sounds like you know, you know, people yell at me on YouTube saying, you know, it made me deaf, but not my fault. A no. um, couple of things. One is um, my usual question, and this time there's only one question. How many of you have not picked a company yet? By this time, you should be too ashamed to even admit it, right? <laughs> Right. So, if you haven't picked a company and you're too ashamed to admit it, fix it, right? Pick a company, right? So, hopefully if you picked a company, you can start to see the process come into play as to what I'm doing on Disney and Vale and my companies, you should be doing on your companies. The second announcement is, have you watched uh, you know, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar? He's walking down the streets of Rome, the soothsayer or whatever he is, crazy guy on the side of the streets. Beware, beware the Ides of March, and a couple of weeks later, he gets killed. Nothing that serious is going to happen to you, but March is upon us. You think, so what? You know what a week from today is going to bring? Good tidings and a quiz, right? So after class today, I will send you a reminder that there is a quiz in case you needed one, in case you haven't been checking your calendar. I will also send you the links to all the past quizzes. And every quiz I've given in this class is on there from, I think, 1997. I've been teaching this class longer than that, but pre-1997, I used to give a midterm rather than a quiz. And I discovered something very seriously flawed about the midterm process. When does a midterm happen? This is kind of a trick question. In the middle of the term, right? The eighth week. So you take a quiz in the eighth week. And one thing to remember about exams and quizzes is you don't realize you're in trouble until you've actually taken it, right? Because it all looks so obvious and you say, I can blow this, back, you know. And then you take the exam and you discover you have a problem. It is too late with a midterm to really fix it. So this is, think of this as an early indicator, your freebie. You know why it's a freebie, right? I'll drop the worst of your three quizzes. Don't take that literally and say, I'll make this my freebie, because it's always nice to hold off and have the freebie on a later quiz. But this is going to be you know, essentially your first you know, exposure to whether you really can do this stuff with 30 minutes time, all the, t all the constraints that come with a quiz. So I'm not trying to freak you out, but I will send you all the past quizzes and every solution with the grading template, which means you can take as many, there are like 20 quizzes, you can take them all, you can take a subset, you can hold out and try a couple in real time. So I will leave that choice to you. I will also send you a link to a review session that I did on the quiz, I'm working on seeing if I can find something that I can do later in the week, because there's no point in my doing a review session now or Tuesday, Wednesday in, in real time, because you're not ready. Until you work through the problems, what's the point of reviewing things you haven't looked at yet? So, but the review session you can watch soon, you can watch later, you can watch multiple times. It's about 35 minutes long. It takes you through the process of working through some past quizzes. So essentially, it's getting your hands dirty. Okay, so I would send those all. I will also send you a seating arrangement. You're saying, what do you mean seating arrangement? I have 260 booked for the day of the quiz, for the first 30. The quiz incidentally is in the first 30 minutes of class, 10:30 to 11. And I have about 90 of you leaving this room and going to 260. You've been in 260, right? It fits 170, so 90 should be comfortable there. The reason I do that is look around you. If you do a quiz in this room, it's a nightmare. If you're left-handed, it's even more of a nightmare. There are like three seats with, you know, crosses and people. Right-handers take it over and then you have to fight them and say, this is my right as a left-hander. And, and you, you know, it's tough to spread your stuff out, especially open book, open notes. So it'll give us all more room. But you have to go where you're asked to go. So I'll give you by alphabetic, basically based on what your last name ends in, whether you go to 260 or here, we'll split into two rooms so that you have room to take the quiz. After the quiz is done, there will be class. So don't just leave and wander off, right? We will come back to class. So we'll start back at about 11.05 or so. But I will send that quiz email out later today. So if you, you know, block me on your email, <laughs> unblock me at least for today, because this email you've got to read, right? 
So any other questions before we start? Yes. Okay, so might as well deal with that. I think I've kind of sent the message out. You can, it's open book, open notes. I do know that many of you have your notes on your iPads or your tablets, so you can bring those in as long as that's what you use them for. I would prefer no laptops open simply because it becomes almost impossible for me to monitor what's going on and they beep. And they, but if the only place you have your notes is on your, la, on your laptop, what are you, 20th century? But that's okay, you can bring your laptop in, but just to look at the notes. Now, this is where the honor, let's face it, we've lost control of this process. The reason I make it open book, open notes is because there's no point keeping it closed book and closed notes. So the honor code kicks in, so you've got to kind of make sure that you know, nothing is going on in your lap. So if the only place you have your notes is your laptop, obviously you can bring it in. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So let's talk about betas. Last session we talked about betas not coming from services, right? Bloomberg doesn't give you betas. Barra doesn't give you betas, though they give you the illusion that they know what the beta of a company is. Then we looked at a regression, because that's how we're all taught to estimate betas. Run a regression, the slope of the line we said was the beta. Today, I'm going to argue that that is not true either, that your beta as a company is driven by choices you make as a company. On what, on what kind of business to be in, how to run the business, how much you borrow, all will play out in your beta. So to set this process up, I'm going to take a bunch of companies that I estimate betas for. This is a very old setup. So some of these companies are now private. Some have gone bankrupt. So you know, different things have happened to them. But here's what I would like to do. I would like to take each company, list the beta that I got for the company, and then ask the question, why? What is it that these companies do that gives them the beta that they do? Are you ready? Let's start at the top of the table, Bulgari. What does Bulgari do? Produce goods that nobody needs that you pay exorbitant prices for, it is a very discretionary product. You're saying, if I can't live without my Bulgari, you need your head examined. <laughs> Trust me, you can. But it is a very discretionary product, and if you have a very discretionary product, your beta is going to be high, high. and here's why. What, do beta, what does beta measure? How well you do when the economy is doing well, how badly you do it. Basically, it measures how you move with the market. And if you have a very discretionary product, you tend to move more with the market. So Bulgaria is a high beta because it produces a very discretionary product. So put, file that away. First thing that drives your beta is what kind of business you're in, how discretionary, non-discretionary. Let's move down. Quest Communications. By itself, telecom is not a discretionary product or service, at least in the US. You'd think telecom companies should have fairly low betas, right, given that but Quest has a high beta. What is it about telecom companies that usually gives them high betas? If it's not the business being risky, unlike Bulgari, what is it that telecom companies tend to do that gives them high betas? Or, you want to try? What is it? Or high capex. One is that they have high capex, but high capex by itself is not the issue. It's how they pay for that high capex, right? You have a lot of infrastructure investments. How do most telecom companies pay for them? They borrow money. I have never understood this. You know why they borrow money? Because that's how AT&T built itself up in the early 1900s. I'm not kidding. The way telecom companies fund their infrastructure reflects the fact that in the early 1900s, when phone companies were built up, they borrowed money to build the phone lines, the infrastructure. And you know why phone lines were able to do that? Normally, when you borrow money, what do you worry about? You worry about the fact that you could build all this infrastructure, and then your products and services, people might not buy them. But what it gave phone companies the confidence that they could borrow money and still pay it off? What were they building into? Phone companies were building into monopolies. They were, that's why they were regulated. They were monopolies. So in the early 1900s, when AT&T borrowed money to build its phone infrastructure, it was building into a monopoly, and that made sense. Power companies tend to borrow a lot of money to build infrastructure. Why? Again, they were building into a monopoly. If you're building into a monopoly, it's cost plus. So what you do is you take the cost and you pass it on, and you get away with it. You take Verizon. Is it building into a monopoly? 
In what business is it a monopoly? Every business it's in looks like a technology business, right? Whether it's cell service or essentially, except for broadband, which Verizon is not that much in. No, basically through the, uh, there's Fios basically. Except for that broadband business, the rest of their business is competitive. It doesn't make any sense anymore, but they still continue to do it. So Quest Communications as a high beta because it borrows a lot of money. So we've got our second input in, right? Discretionary product, how much have you borrowed? Let's move down. Microsoft, beta 1.25. Microsoft, when I started in 1986, I, I estimated it's beta when it went public, had a beta of about two, two and a half when it first came out. Young technology company just trying to get into business. IBM dominated the business, high beta. I've tracked Microsoft's bait over time, and it's tended to move down over time towards one. This is the tendency that Bloomberg uses to adjust betas towards one, that as companies get bigger, you know, what changed at Microsoft? It still gets a big chunk of its revenues from Office and Windows, but think of how widely they use, right? It's not just business software. It's kind of general software. It has a broad market. So the market has become wider. It has also entered the cloud business, a very different business. It's a server business where different businesses use that cloud to essentially provide their services. And it's also accumulated cash on the side. All three will tend to affect your beta. The first one, as you get to a broader market, will mean that your beta moves towards one. You're no longer catering to a niche, niche part of the market. Everybody buys office software. So that pushes the beta towards one. The cloud business, because you're serving other businesses. If you think about who the customers for Microsoft Cloud, it's pretty much everybody. It's retailers, it's manufacturers, it's service companies, it's the government. That pushes the beta towards one. And by having cash, what do you do to your beta? What is, what's the beta of cash? It's zero. Basically, you invest in T-bills, commercial paper. You're investing something with the, so holding big cash balances almost acts like a, you know, a drag on your beta. It pulls your beta down. All of those forces are pushing the beta down. And then you have GE. This is with a healthy GE. This is GE circa 2007, when it was actually a company, not a walking dead company or a zombie, but a company. And in 2007, you know what businesses GE was in? Actually, the question I should ask you is what businesses it was not in because it was pretty much every business. It was in 26 different businesses. It was the ultimate conglomerate, right? And what should happen to the bait of a company as it conglomerates? I don't even know whether that's the right word, conglomerates, as it goes across multiple businesses. What should happen to the beta? It should move towards a beta for the market, which is close to one. The only reason G's beta stayed consistently above one is the biggest part of G in 2007 was not its aircraft engines or its appliance business, it was G Capital. You think, so what? G Capital is a financial service company, and it carried $150 billion in debt. Here again, debt comes into play. Because they had debt, their beta didn't move to one or below, it actually stayed above one, because debt acts as a ballast pushing your beta up. And then we go below the line, and you have Exxon Mobil, oil company, big oil company. If you're a big oil company, what's your biggest driver of earnings, cash flow, stock prices? Oil prices. So when you think of oil companies, you tend to think of them as risky. Oil prices do go up and down. So how come its beta is only 0.7? Oil prices go up, what happens? Exxon Mobil goes up, right? Oil prices goes up, go up, what happens to United Airlines holding all its constant? It goes down. Oil prices can actually cut in the opposite direction for the rest of the market. Do you see where I'm going? Betas measure how you move with the market. And if your primary risk is a commodity risk, you will be risky as a standalone company. But added to a portfolio, you might actually bring the beta, you might end up with a low beta because you, your primary risk is risk that is moving in the other direction for the rest of the market. And that varies across time. There are some periods where oil prices and stocks move together and some periods where they move separately. But just because a company is risky, it's volatile, doesn't mean it'll have a high beta. And then you get to 
Philip Morris. I'll go with the old name first, and then we'll see whether changing your name can change your beta. Philip Morris. Why does it have such a low beta? Think Bulgari and think the exact opposite, and you'll have the answer. Why was Bulgari's beta so high? The product was very discretionary. You want a low beta as a company, and you insist on it. I have some advice for you. Try to make your product or service an addiction. And I'm not being facetious. If you make your product or service an addiction, you will end up with a low beta because people will have to buy your, beta, your product in good times or in bad times. And don't look down on Philip Morris because they do it. If Morgan Stanley could addict you to structured products, <laughs> would they? If the Gap could addict you to khakis, would they? Every company dreams of doing it. It just doesn't work for them. So when you look at a company and you see its beta, you, you might see a regression number, you might see a service number. What I want you to now think about is what is it that drives the beta? What business are you in? How much have you borrowed? And I'll add one more factor, which is embedded in these companies when I, you know, in a couple of minutes. One final point. I have Harmony Gold Mining, beta of point, minus 0.15. Now, a few years ago, I wrote a blog post on, can your beta be negative? Because it is a favorite interview question that people get asked. Um, so can betas be negative? Let's work this through. When you have a negative beta, and you plug it into the CAPM, risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, what do you come up with as an expected return? So if your risk-free rate is 2%, your beta is minus 0.2, and you multiply that by your equity risk premium, 5, 6, 7%, you're going to end up with an expected return that's less than the risk-free rate. And part of you is saying, why would I accept less than the risk-free rate on an investment? Why would you? What does a negative beta tell you about, about an investment? Adding that investment to a portfolio. Everything is about portfolios here, right? Adding a negative beta investment to a portfolio does what to your portfolio? It actually makes your portfolio less risky. It, it, it basically must insure you against some macroeconomic risk. So what is the big macroeconomic risk that gold has historically provided a hedge against? Inflation and global crises, right? In the last week, for instance, gold was one of the fewer assets that held up most of its value. So inflation, but inflation. In the 1970s, for instance, when inflation got high, because remember, if, when you're looking at paper currency, it's just paper, if you think about it, backed up by a central bank. And if you stop trusting the paper, which is what inflation does to you, what do you do? You take your money out of paper and you put it in something physical and tangible. And gold, for thousands of years, has been that asset. If you want to know why gold, why not some other? I mean, go look at the elements. I think gold has properties that make it a good place to put you. It, it is, I think, the, one of the more difficult elements to completely destroy. You can melt it and make it into different shapes. But whatever the reason, gold has acted as a hedge against inflation. You're buying insurance. The key word is buying insurance, right? So what do I charge you? If you want to buy gold, I'm going to say, OK, you're buying insurance. Pay me. And the way I make you pay me is accept less than the risk free rate. And there is a lesson embedded here. Gold is a very safe investment. Actually, it's a negative beta investment if you're an investor who's diversified with all of your money in financial assets. But if you decide to take all your money and buy gold, God help you. There are people out there called gold bugs. They've been around for centuries. And you can read what they say. And basically, I'll save you the trouble of reading what they say. Here's what they say. Sell everything, buy gold. Sell everything, buy gold. That's pretty much the message. Their entire website's dedicated to this. That the end is coming. They're like that guy on Times Square you walk by. You walk by this guy, I don't know whether he's still there. The end is coming. Repent, repent. Okay. And then they whine and they moan about how unfair markets are. You know why they whine and moan? Because they've been holding only gold for the last 40 years. 
You know how much money you've made if you'd held only gold? You made about 2 or 3% returns per year. And they said, this is so unfair. We make so little. And my response is, it's your own fault because you bought just gold. And that's something to remember about betas. If you look at a low beta investment, don't jump to the conclusion that if you buy all your, put all your money in that stock, you're not going to be exposed to risk because beta measures only the portion of the risk you cannot diversify away. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take what we've learned by looking at these companies and start to list out three variables, and there are only three that would determine your beta. So you told me you'd picked a company already. So as I go through my list, I want you to think about your company and start thinking about if I were building up a beta for my company based on what I know about the company, what kind of beta would I expect it to have? You ready? Here's the first factor that drives your beta. Since betas measure how you move the market, your beta should reflect the business or service you provide, the product or service. In the old, until about 1985 or 1990, the line I used to draw is if you're a cyclical company, you should have a higher beta than if you're a non-cyclical company because cyclical companies tend to move with the economy. And if you move with the economy, you tend to go into, you're going to move with the market. So housing stocks and automobile stocks, for instance, should have higher betas than food processing companies. But I don't think that distinction works anymore. In the old manufacturing world, you could draw, these are cyclical, these are non-cyclical, but if I ask you the same question about Google or about Apple, it's much hazier now as to what's cyclical and what's non-cyclical. So here's my second and I think more, in, more interesting way of dividing companies. The more discretionary the product or service you provide as a company to your customers, the higher your beta will be as a company. You know what I mean by discretionary, right? If your customers can delay buying your product, defer buying your product or service, you will have a higher beta than if they cannot do that. So I gave you an example already with Bulgari, but I'm going to give you what made this stick for me when I first started thinking about how can I explain discretionary and non-discretionary. About 20 years ago, I decided to take a walk. I mean, I was tired of doing whatever I was doing. I decided to take a walk down Fifth Avenue. So I took the N or the R, I don't remember which one. I got off at 60th and 5th, and I strongly suggest that you follow my path on this one. So take the N or the R, don't take Uber, don't take a cab, it'll take too long. Get off at 60th and 5th, and I want you to go for a, vert, for a real walk down 5th Avenue. And as you walk down 5th Avenue, here's what I'd like you to do. Stop in front of every business, turn to it and say, very loudly ask, if that business were traded, what kind of beta would I expect it to have? <laughs> Now you're saying, why loudly? Because people will think you're crazy, and that's a good thing. They will cross the street to avoid you. You'll get the entire sidewalk for yourself. So let's go for a virtual walk. I don't go down Fifth Avenue very much, so many of these stores might have disappeared. But I remember my walk. I get off at 60th and 5th. I walk down, and I look to my left, and who do I see first? It used to be... FAO Schwartz. So don't say Bergdorf Goodman. You've crossed a couple of blocks already. So don't go too fast. FAO Schwartz, high beta or low beta? Depends on who's making the list of what to buy this month. I still remember taking my older son, he was about seven or eight, into FAO Schwartz. And you know, we, it, euphemistically, it was called coming in with dad to work. And this is how it worked. You know, we'd get on the train, we'd get off in the city, and said, Ryan, do you want to go into work with me? And he said, no, Dad, let's go to a baseball card store. And there used to be quite a few. You'd go to a baseball card store, then get a snack. Snacks were always big. And then we ended up at F.A.O. Schwartz. And there was a Ferrari on sale for $8,000. That's pretty reasonable for a Ferrari, right? It was one of those miniaturized Ferraris for an eight-year-old with everything. And I still remember what my son said. He said, Dad, if I don't have that, I will die. <laughs> I said, I don't think so, Ryan. Let's walk around. If it looks like you're drooping on the verge of death, I'll bring you back and get the Ferrari. <laughs> 22 years later, he seems to be OK. A <laughs> lot more discretionary than he made it out to be, right? So you pass every, now it's the Apple store. Don't even ask me discretionary or non-discretionary. I'll tell you something about my Apple addiction, if I told you that. You cross 59th, and you're in what I call the French-Italian section of town. Gucci, Ferragamo, high beta, high beta, high beta, high beta. 
Hold on to your wallet. I've heard that you actually can get charged as you walk by the stores. Okay. And then you get to about 53rd, 52nd. The betas start to droop. Not as much as they used to. In the old days, they really started to droop. You see an amazing number of drained reeds start to pop up. It's almost like they're trying to get you. So you zig and you zag, avoiding them. And then you get to the New York Public Library on 42nd Street. Betas used to hit rock bottom. You'd walk by stores with brown paper in the windows, a shady looking character in the doorway saying, come on in, it's cheap, cheap. Cheap what? Just come on in. <laughs> and you'd see tourists going in and not coming out. I don't know what risk that is. You know? But you make it through that gauntlet down to 34th and 5th. There's a guy who sells umbrellas only when it rains. He's still there. I don't know where he comes from. I think he just pops out of the ground. Crappy little umbrellas, but guess what? If you've got your laptop on your back and the subway stop is six blocks away, you're going to buy that crappy umbrella. If that guy ever figured out a way to incorporate and trade, he'd have a really low beta. Umbrellas when it rains in New York. You tell me what you do as a business, I can start guessing your beta. So you ready? I'm going to throw a few companies at you. And based on what you perceive their business to be, you tell me what kind of beta you'd expect this company to have. The New York Times. What are the two businesses, or what are the two revenue streams the New York Times has? One is subscriptions, and the other is advertising. The subscription part is actually remarkably stable. Why? Because people don't want to send the wrong signal to their neighbors. Right? People start noticing the Times is not arriving on your driveway. They start asking, you never read the Times, but it arrives in that blue, sh you know, everybody knows it. it's okay. You still have your job. But the advertising part is pretty volatile. It depends on how the economy is doing. I tell people, you can tell how well the economy is doing by just picking up your Sunday Times. When the economy is doing well, it's hefty. That magazine runs like 300 pages. Like that, fa you know, that fashion magazine that they, who reads that crap? But it's like 300 pages in good times. In bad times, it becomes a little sliver, two pages. New York Times, high beta because a big chunk of its business is advertising. How about Coca-Cola? Admit it, you got to get really desperate to go down the generic cola aisle in the grocery store, right? <laughs> in fact, if you get one, you hope that nobody's looking at you. It's not my sort. No, no, I always get co no. <laughs> Brand name plus low price kind of converge to keep the betas low. All you need to do is think about what companies do and already have the foundations for building up to a beta. So when we talk about discredit, I told you every class you've ever taken in your life is in service of this one. Remember that econ class? There was actually a term used to measure discretionary, non-discretionary. Do you remember what that was? Elasticity of demand. If you have a product or service with very elastic demand, you will have a high beta. If it's inelastic, you'll have a low beta. There, that's the only reason the econ class mattered. Now you might as well forget it. So I'm going to make you try this out on, you know, with, with an example. Let's assume that we're looking at phone service. As I said, phone service in Europe and North America and developed markets tends to be non-discretionary. In fact, in much of the world, I think you're required to give people phones so they can get to 911. The days of cell service that's starting to shift, but phone service tends to be non-discretionary. But in much of the rest of the world, Asia and Latin America, it is discretionary in the sense of if you're doing well, you might have a phone. But if you don't, then you kind of hold off on it. Do you see where I'm going? You can have a product or service be non-discretionary in developed markets and be discretionary in emerging markets. So I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. If you buy into the notion that your beta reflects it, would you expect telecom companies in emerging markets to have higher betas or lower betas than developed markets? It's kind of a slam dunk question. Higher beta. So one, if you, later on, I'm going to talk about how I estimate betas by region of the world for different sectors. I report a global telecom, I report an emerging market telecom, I report a US telecom, and it seems like too much stuff coming at you. The reason I do it is in some businesses, 
you might decide to go with the global average saying it looks the same around the world. So if I'm looking at an aerospace company in Brazil, like Embraer, then I don't care if it's emerging or developed markets because they all sell to the airlines, they all sell to the same customers. So I can use Boeing and Embraer and say, hey, they're playing in the same game. But when you're talking about something that's regulated, that tends to be regional, you might start to divide how you think about that business based on where it's located. Let's move on to the second determinant. So the business you've chosen will drive how sensitive you are to the economy. So if you pick something that's discretionary, you'll have more sensitive. Incidentally, we talked about food processing companies having low betas. Okay? One of the questions, in fact, the post-class test today asks is, if you looked at retailing, and I'll give you the breakdown, I'll give you the actual post-class test question, you can solve it right now. You can break down retailing into multiple classes. You can have luxury retailers, you can have department stores, or the few that are left. You can have discount retailers, and you can have grocery stores. Which group would you expect to have the highest beta, and which group would you expect to have the lowest beta? Luxury retailers will have the highest beta and groceries. Now, within grocery stores, you've got Safeway, and you've got Kroger, and you also have Whole Foods, and you've got Sprouts. In the West Coast, mostly, but still Sprouts. They're, bought, they're all grocery stores, right? But if you were asked to differentiate across grocery stores, would you expect Whole Foods to have a lower beta than the typical grocery store, or a higher beta? Why? Because when you're doing well, you're willing to pay three times the price for eggplant because it's organic and you want to eat well. If you've lost your job, you really don't care anymore. You're going to die. So what does it matter whether you eat organic eggplant or inorganic eggplant? So you basically go to Safeway and buy your eggplant at 39 cents a pound or whatever you get it for. You can already see that if, even within businesses, you can have this play out. Let's move to the second element that drives your beta. You can take a safe business, and your earnings can still be very volatile if you have a lot of fixed costs. And here's why. When you have a lot of fixed costs, in good times you make a lot of money, in bad times you lose a lot of money. Essentially, it exaggerates everything that's happening to the revenues. So high fixed costs translate into more volatile operating income, and more volatile earnings translate into higher basis. Now, this is more sector-driven, right? So some businesses tend to have higher fixed costs than others. And one of my favorite examples of a high fixed cost business is the airline business. Let's break down the cost for a typical airline. What's the biggest single expense usually that most, most airlines have? The aircraft, leasing the aircraft, fixed cost or variable cost? Can you imagine going to GE Capital or whoever you leased it from saying, look guys, our planes were only half full, could we pay half the lease? Doesn't quite work, right? Fixed cost. Second biggest cost is usually fuel cost. Fixed cost or variable cost? Variable. You must be flying spirit all the time. Because it's variable, why? Because there are only five people in the plane, what does spirit do? It cancels the flight. Gives you some cockamamie reason, like the aircraft has trouble. But if you're an airline that actually has to fly people and you want them to keep coming back, which spirit obviously doesn't, you've got to stick to a schedule, whether there are five people or 15 people on the plane. Can you imagine getting on a plane and the pilot comes out and starts counting the people? and then yells out of the window, if there is a window, saying, hey guys, fill it up halfway, there are only 15 people on the plane. There'd be, there won't be 15 people left on the plane after he does that. Once you've decided to fly, I know the load factor and the weight can affect how much fuel you have, but you're flying from New York to San Diego, or New York to LA. Hey, guess what? You're going to be using up just as much fuel almost if you fly five people as 50 people, so fuel cost tends to be fixed cost as well. Employee cost for many of these airlines is fixed cost. You can't exactly lay off half your employees for two months just because people are not flying. And here's a cost that we don't even think about. Have you ever flown United out of Newark? I mean, if you have a vision of hell, this is very close to it, right? <laughs> you enter the terminal, there are like 150 gates. And God help you if you have a connecting flight through Newark because they fly you into gate seven and say, your connecting flight is in gate 95. And I think there's a guy upstairs watching you on 
TV run and said, she's not going to make it. Let's switch it. I mean, it's like a little game. You're like rats in a maze. But they have every single gate in that terminal. And how do they get the rights to these gates? They pay Newark Airport. Just like British Airways controls us, there's gates in Heathrow, it pay. This is a big source of revenues to airports. Is it a fixed cost or variable cost? It's a fixed cost. Whether one plane leaves out of the, uh, the gate of 15, you're going to have to pay that cost. So with airlines, have you noticed that there's never no, a, a normal year? They're either making billions or going bankrupt. It's like watching a manic depressive in action. But that's what fixed costs do to you. They're basically going to make good times great and bad times terrible. I mean, I'll give you an illustration of how this plays out. I think about uh, three years ago, Delta had a good quarter. Its revenues went up, I think, 5%. You think that's a good quarter? When revenues went up 5%, operating income jumped 41%. That's how it's going to play out, is when you have high fixed costs, small changes in revenues will translate into big changes in operating income. United Airlines last week announced that it was withdrawing its guidance for this year. The companies said, this is how much we're going to make it. Part of the reason is they don't know what's happening. I mean, they don't know what's coming, but they do know there's going to be a drop off. You're saying, how big can it be? Maybe it's only 4 or 5%. Maybe it's only 4 or 5% drop in revenues, but that's going to translate into a 35 or 40% drop in operating income. And if it's a 7 or 8% drop in revenues, these companies will all start to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. Go back and look at what happened in the last quarter of 2001 after 9-11 to the airline revenues and earnings. I mean, basically, you see a, collapse in, a drop in revenues, but a complete collapse in earnings. So when you think about fixed costs, that's why you think about it. But within the airline business, to again show you that there are exceptions, just like in the grocery business, what's the exception in the airline business? What's the one airline that's been more written about in cases than any other company in history? Southwest, right? And what does Southwest do that makes it different? First, it flies planes, obviously. But until very recently, every aircraft that Southwest used was a Boeing 737. Not a 737 MAX, thank God, but a 737. You know why they just use one type of aircraft? Because it meant that they had to keep only one maintenance crew in every airport. It kept their cost structure down. They do use fuel like any other airline, and I hope they don't economize because I do fly Southwest sometimes. But here's one thing that Southwest does that makes them different from most other airlines. They hedge consistently. You know what I mean by hedge consistently? They do it all the time. As opposed to what? As opposed to most airlines would start hedging when they shouldn't and stop hedging when they shouldn't. In fact, one of the best indicators of what oil prices are going to do is look at what airlines are doing and do the exact opposite. <laughs> there are only two airlines in the world that hedge consistently, Southwest and Singapore Air. And what does it do? It basically gives them a cost structure that they know when they set the tickets. That's why Southwest airline tickets don't go up and down. They're pretty stable relative to other airlines. You don't get massive discounts. You don't get a massive jump in price. So with fuel, they try to keep the cost something they can build into their price. Employees, it surprises people. But Southwest is a unionized airline, but it's got the most flexible workforce of any of the airlines. It's the only airline where a stewardess has checked me on. Has it ever happened to you on United? You could be waiting at the counter for hours, surrounded by stewardesses, and they're all checking out their job description, saying, no, no, I can't do that. It's not in my job description. I remember a Southwest flight where the entertainment system broke down, and the stewardess told us jokes for the rest. I mean, this was well beyond the call of duty. She was very good. She was a comedian. Yeah. Incredibly fl But here's the biggest savings Southwest has had relative to the typical airline. I remember the first time I flew Southwest out of the East Coast. I made a reservation to fly to LA. New York to LA, right? I didn't even check my ticket till the day of the flight. So I checked my ticket to see which airport I should go to, expecting one of three, JFK, LaGuardia, or Newark. And it said Islip. For those of you from Islip, don't take this personally. But I didn't even know where Islip was. I had to go look on the map at this town in Long Island. So I get in this cab, take me to Islip. He says, where is Islip? So I had to tell him. This was days before Uber. 
I end up in Islip, I get on the southwest plane, this is a quaint little airport. And I fly across the country, and we land in LA, I come out of the plane, and I see a giant statue of John Wayne in the airport. And I said, this is an LAX. We landed in Orange County for Southwest. That was what their cross-country flight was. I slipped to, Anaheim, or to, 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 to Orange County. You think, why? Because they didn't want to pay for the gates in JFK, LaGuardia, or Newark, or in LAX. And for the longest time, this was their pattern. Every day they didn't fly to O'Hare, they flew into Midway. They basically chose lower profile airports. And it both cost them and helped them. It cost them, why? Because they lost all those business passengers who might want to go through Newark or JFK or LaGuardia. But what they, get, what they gained from it was much lower costs in the bad times, which is the reason in nine, uh, right after 9-11, Southwest was the only airline that still continued to report profits in the quarter after, because they were able to bring their costs down. Sometimes companies view their cost structure as a given. But to the degree that you have some play in it, to the, you can bring those fixed costs down, you're going to benefit with the lower beta. So if that's true then, you should be looking at the fixed and the variable costs in your company, right? What's the challenge we face in, in doing that? You open up the income statement for a company. What's the challenge in looking at fixed and variable costs? How do accountants do their, their income? They start with revenues. They subtract cost to goods sold not variable fix, they subtract SGNA, depreciation. In other words, there is no breakdown of fixed and variable. You could try to guess. But the problem we often face is an informational problem. How do we know what costs are fixed, what are variable? So if I, try, if I told you, go look up the fix and the variable cost in your company, you're going to come back and say, I really don't know. I can try to guess based on the business they're in. So I'm going to suggest a shortcut. It's not a great shortcut, it's not a perfect shortcut, but one that if you can use over enough time might give you an indication. Remember I said if you have a lot of fixed costs, small changes in revenues translate into big changes in operating income. What if I gave you 20 years of data on your company, which is 80 quarters, and you could look at the change in revenues every quarter and the change in operating income every quarter. If you divide the change in your operating income, earnings before interest and taxes, just operating income, by the change in revenues, if you have a lot of fixed costs, this number should be a high number. This, when it's your very low fixed costs, the number should be a low number. You're saying, why go back 20 years? Why don't I just look at last year? Because all kinds of things can happen to your revenues and operating income in any given year. You need to do this over time. So I tried this on Disney. I took annual data going from 1987 through 2013. So that's the revenue numbers. And I also looked at the operating income numbers. So these are easy numbers to pull up for your company. So if we go to S&P Capital IQ, you know, that's my little nag to have you registered and got access. You can download this in a minute for your company as long as the company's been around. And every year I computed the percentage change in revenues and the percentage change in operating income. If I take the entire time period, it looks like my revenues increased 11.79% a year over this period and my operating income increased by 11.91%. 11.91 divided by 11.79 is 1.01. I'll talk about how to read that number in a minute. But there's one thing about Disney that makes this period a little tricky. In 1996, Disney bought Cap Cities ABC. And when it bought Cap Cities ABC, it changed its structure as a company. So if I look at post-96, I get revenue growth of 8.16% and operating income growth of 10.2%. Now, divide 10.2 by 8.16, I'm getting 1.25, which I think is closer to where Disney is today, given that ABC is part of Disney. Now, here I've, and I'll make a confession, I computed the 1.25. I looked at it and said, is that high, is that low? I have no idea. I had no, no frame of reference. So I went and did this for every entertainment company. Sounds like I collect. But again, all I went to Capital IQ is I collected the data for each entertainment company. And I came up with an average for the sector of 1.35. So I'm going to ask you to read this number for me. For Disney, the number was 1.01 or 1.25, depending on the time period you use. The average entertainment company is 1.35. What does that tell you about Disney as a company that has in terms of fixed costs and betas. Less fixed costs and lower beta, or more fixed costs and higher beta? 
it's lower fixed cost and lower beta. Now we'll come back and talk about, but the reason I don't want to get too carried away is these are estimates as a standard error on them. I don't think 1.25 and 1.35 are statistically that different. So I'm not going to go crazy on Disney, but if I do this for the airline business, the difference between Southwest and the rest of the airline business is huge. So here's my suggestion. For most of your companies, talk the talk on fixed costs, but then walk away. It's really not worth digging in. But if you have a company that is exceptional in terms of how it approaches its costs, it's different in its business model, it might be worth doing this analysis to see, should I be giving my company a much higher beta or a much lower beta than the rest of the sector because of the way they do business? There are airlines, for instance, that offer only business class flights. Now, I almost took one to Paris last week. It's a lot of comp comp I, I can't even pronounce the French word, but it's actually, a, you know, it flies out of New York to Paris. That's all they do, it's just business class. And if I were valuing that airline, I would use a much higher beta than I would for a typical airline because that flight is going to be completely empty if economies slow down. So the second stop in the game, you're basically asking, what's my cost structure going to look like? Any questions on fixed and variable costs? In fact, this is one of the things to think about when you think about the drive towards outsourcing you're seeing at many companies. You know what outsourcing basically does, right? It takes a cost that used to be a fixed cost in your company and makes it a variable cost. So instead of running a cafeteria in your, you know, in, in your company and paying for the costs of maintaining that cafeteria, you might outsource me. So basically anybody who wants food, you just pick up a phone, you call a service, the service delivers the food. It might not provide the kind of communal spirit that a cafeteria does. Those are great places to kind of hang out right, and talk to others. I'm just being cynical. Okay? But it might mean that you say you've taken a cost that used to be a fixed cost and made it a variable cost. So when you think about outsourcing, this might be one of the factors that can cause you to outsource is to make a fixed cost into a variable cost. Which brings me to third and final factor, which is how much have you borrowed? When you borrow money, you create a fixed cost you did not have until you borrowed the money. And what's that fixed cost? Interest expenses. You've got to make it in good times, you've got to make it in bad times. When you borrow money, your equity income becomes more volatile, no matter what business you're in. And here I can start to be more specific about the effect. Because unlike fixed costs and variable costs, I know what the debt and equity are. And in fact, there's a link between what beta I observe for your stock and how much you've borrowed. Don't ask me why the symbols have gone crazy on my, in fact, in your notes, it probably says bicycle still. Now make it a beta again. No? So I'm going to introduce two concepts here. The first is a concept of what I'm going to call a levered beta. And the second is a concept that I'm going to call an unlevered beta. And let me explain. The unlevered beta reflects the business choice you made and your fixed costs in that business. The levered beta is the beta that you observe for your equity. Here's what happens. You have no debt. Your beta will be an unlevered beta because you basically have your business and fixed costs. When you borrow money, I'm going to measure how much you borrow with a debt to equity ratio. Both are in market value terms because this is about the future, about raising money, debt to equity. So as you borrow money, that ratio will go up. So if you have $100 in debt and you borrow 50, that debt to equity ratio is 50%. You're saying, why am I multiplying by 1 minus t? It is true interest is a fixed cost, but it comes with a little bonus, right? What's the bonus? It's tax deductible. To the extent that the government is giving you a tax shield, you're saying, it's a fixed cost, but it's not as big a load as it would have been if I didn't get the tax benefit. So I multiply by 1 minus the tax rate. This is called a Hamada bait. It's been around for 50 years in finance. It makes all kinds of assumptions to get there. For instance, it assumes that all of the risk in a company is borne by the equity investors, which if you're a junk bond investor is actually not true. You know that you bear some of the risk. But by doing it, I get this very convenient link between how much have you borrowed and what your beta will be. So the levered beta is, a, is the beta for your equity. The unlevered beta reflects the beta for your business. Now let me loop back to how we estimated betas. We ran a regression, right? We got a regression beta. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question about regression betas. You run a regression, you get that regression beta. Let's say you trust the regression beta. Is that regression beta levered beta or an unlevered beta? 
you got a 50-50 shot. How many of you think it's a Levitt beta? How many think it's a non-Levitt beta? Why do you think it's a non-Levitt beta? I'm very really used to the shot, I guess. Okay. How, why do you think it's a Levitt beta? It depends on, so that is a regression against the market of the company. And the company might no, no, no. It's not a regression of the company. It's a regression of the earnings. stock price of the company. Do you see why, why it's a levit beta? You use stock prices. So if you borrow a lot of money, what happens? Your stock prices become more volatile. You use stock prices, so it's a levit beta. Now let me ask you a follow-up question. What's the leverage that's built into that beta? It is a levit beta, but what's a debt? Remember I said the levit beta reflects your debt to equity ratio? But neither ran this regression for Disney, and I came up with a beta 1.25. The beta reflects not the debt to equity ratio that Disney has today, it reflects the debt to equity ratio that Disney had over the last five years. Do you see why? Because the stock prices get. And already you can see one more reason to mistrust regression betas. Let's say your company had absolutely no debt for the last four years and 364 days. And on the very last day of the fifth year, they went on and borrowed $100 billion. Your regression beta will not reflect it because it came from looking at the last five years of data. But I'll give you a way, if that's your only concern, you can fix it. Let's say I took the beta 1.25 that I have for Disney, and I told you that the average debt to equity ratio over that period was 19.44%. Remember, I can observe both, how much debt they had, what the market value of equity was. On average, it was 19.44%. So the regression beta is 11 beta. Now I've told you what debt to equity ratio Disney had during the period. And let me also you know, give you a tax rate. Let's say over this five-year period, Disney's marginal tax rate, the tax rate in the last dollar of income was 36.1%. So the regression beta is a levit beta. I've told you the debt to equity ratio in the beta and the tax rate that the company faced. I could unlever the beta, right? What I'm doing with unlevering the beta is taking out the effect of debt. So I take the regression beta, levit beta, I divide by 1 plus 1 minus the tax rate times the debt to equity, and I come up with an unlevered beta 1.11. Now, I don't want this to become mechanical, so we're going to play a game. Have you seen Jeopardy? You know how Jeopardy works. It's a really strange game show because you're given the answer, and you have to guess the question. I don't know what twisted mind came up with this view. So I'm going to give you the answer, and I want you to guess the question. If 1.11 is the answer, what is the question? And don't say, what's your unlevered beta? I want something a little deeper than that. What is the question to which 1.11 is the answer? Anybody want to try? You want to try? Yeah? Yeah? And could Disney have chosen to have no debt over the last five years? Yes. yes, right? So the first question, see, you knew the question already. So, you know, you could probably, what was the guy, Jennings, who won the big, big prize? You can beat him now. Okay? So if the first question to which 1.11 is the answer is, if Disney had been an all-equity funded company over the last five years, what would their beta have been? And the answer is 1.11. There's another question to which 1.11 is the answer as well, right? And what's that question? What's the beta of Disney's underlying businesses? Remember, it's in theme parks and cruise ships and you know, movies and broadcasting. What's the beta of your business? Remember, the beta of your equity reflects what your equity is doing. The beta of your business reflects the businesses you're in. The unlevered beta is the beta of the underlying business you've chosen. If debt is a choice, I can now ask a follow-up question. What would happen to that beta if Disney chose to increase or reduce its debt to equity ratio? Because it's a choice, right? It can choose to go to no debt, in which case its beta will become 1.11. It can choose to reduce its debt to 10%, in which case its beta will be 1.19. Or it can just choose, and this would be a crazy choice, to do a leverage buyout of itself. You know what happens in a leverage buyout? You basically borrow a ton of money and you buy out the equity in the company. And in a typical LBO, the debt ratio goes to 90%. 90% of your capital comes from debt, which means there's only $10 of equity for every $10, no, 90 Your debt to equity ratio jumps to 900%. 
And if they do a leverage buyout, their beta will jump to 7.5. Think about it, right? 7.5 times more risky than the typical stock. You're saying Disney 7.5 times as risky as the average stock? You can take any company and make it an incredibly risky equity investment by doing what? By borrowing a ton of money. And what I've captured here is the effect of the leverage. And this is a tool you can now use to ask the question, what will happen to my beta if I change my views on that? Yes? Yeah. Market values, always market values. In fact, the only place in finance, and I'll say the, this is a question that will recur repeatedly, right? Because you have a cost to capital debt ratio. The only place in finance we ever use book values is when we compute accounting returns, return on equity and return on invested capital. Everywhere else in this class, when we talk about debt and equity, it's always market value. Yeah. Well, let's start with the book value of debt. Why would the market value of debt be different from the book value? Tell me the conditions. Which are, why, why would the market price of a bond deviate from the face value of a bond? Because interest rates move, right? So if I gave you the book value of debt, and I told you how much interest Disney is paying on the debt, then I also told you, how much Disney will have to pay today to borrow the money. You can convert book debt to market debt. I'm actually taking away an excuse that every investment banker has used, which is there is no market value of debt, therefore I'm going to use book value of debt to go. And I'm going to say, no, no, that's not true. We can estimate a market value of debt. It's not a, as big a deal as market value of equity. Why? Because the market value of debt is not going to be 10 times the book value as book value of, uh, market value of equity can be, or one-tenth the book value. So you could probably get away using book value for most companies, but why? Why not convert it to market value debt? Right? So those are the three. And in fact, now this tool is going to come in very handy later on, because what's the second part of corporate finance is after we've dealt with the investment principle, we're going to get to the financing principle. principle. And one of the questions we're going to ask is, what's the right mix of debt and equity for my company? where we're going to actually take the debt ratio and say, should I double my debt? And now we have a way of adjusting the cost of equity for whatever you decide to do with your debt ratio. So let me summarize. When you look at the beta of a company, it comes from the choices you make about what business you're in, your product or service, how discretionary it is. It's going to depend on how much you have as fixed cost as a business. And third, it's going to depend on how much you borrow. That's it. Everything else is a side story. You're saying, what about the quality of management? Quality of management is not going to show up in your beta. And don't freak out. Say, but my company should be more valuable. I'm not preventing you from showing the value. But if you have high quality management, you know where it's going to show up? You're going to have higher margins and higher cash flows and higher earnings. The discount rate is not the vehicle where you punish a company for having bad management or reward a company for having good management. It's designed to capture exposure to macroeconomic risk. Now let's talk about a property that betas have that's incredibly useful and it's going to give us an opening to get rid of regression betas. Betas are weighted averages. You think, who cares? What's the big deal? Let's say I came to you with Fidelity Magellan, one of the largest mutual funds in the world. It has 150 companies in the portfolio. And I ask you, what's the beta of my portfolio, Fidelity Magellan? What is it going to be? It's going to be a weighted average of the betas of the 150 companies. Weighted by what? By how much money you have in each one. This is true whether you're Fidelity Magellan or whether you're an individual. For those of you who have portfolios, here's an exercise you can do. Take the 9, 10, 15, or 150 stocks you have in your portfolio if you're really wealthy. You can pull up the betas, and you can pull up regression betas if you want. Pull up how much money you have in each stock, which your brokerage or contract report. Take a weighted average. The beta of a portfolio is always a weighted average of the individual stocks that go into that portfolio. We're not in a portfolio management class, so that's really not what's going to be useful for us in corporate finance. The beta of a company is a weighted average of the betas of the individual businesses that the company operates in. Remember how many businesses I told you GE was operating in in 2007? 26 different businesses, right? So if I could give you a beta for each business, and you say, how the hell are you going to get that? Let's assume I could give you a beta for each of the 26 businesses Disney was in. Could you compute a beta for GE as a company? I don't see why not. You could take a weighted average, weighted by how much value they have in each business. 
In fact, I'm going to use that in two contexts. One is to look at what happens to a company after a merger. And a Morgan Stanley buying E-Trade. If I ask you what will happen to the beta for Morgan Stanley after the E-Trade acquisition? Buyer buying Monsanto. What will happen to the beta of buyer after it buys Monsanto? But I'm going to go back in time and stick with my own companies. I'm going to take that 1996 acquisition of Capital Cities ABC by Disney. I should update this and make it the Fox now because we now have an even bigger deal. But what I do with Cap Cities ABC is exactly what you do if I ask you what will happen to Disney's beta when it buys Fox for $70 billion. So this is 1996. Disney decides to buy Cap Cities ABC. Both were publicly traded companies, and here's what the companies look like. Disney, the acquirer, had an equity beta of 1.15. Remember, that's a levered beta. They had debt of 3.2 billion, market value of equity of 31.1 billion. And if I add those two numbers up, Disney as a company, as a firm, was worth 34.3 billion. So I'm adding the equity to the debt. Think of that as the value of the firm in market value terms. If I take Cap Cities, they had an equity beta of 0.95. They had very little debt, 615 million. They had equity of 18.5 billion. If I add those two numbers up, I, so I have a $34 billion company buying a $19 billion company, and I've given you the equity betas for the two companies. So here's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to compute what the beta for Disney will be after the acquisition. But to compute that, I have to tell you one more thing, which is Disney's buying cap cities, I have to tell you where they're going to come up with the money, right? And what are the two choices? They can either use equity, maybe pay with shares, or they can use debt. Okay? We'll hold off on that for a moment. Initially, let's compute what the beta for the combined company will be, because this is independent of how they fund it. So here's the first step. I'm going to compute the unlevered betas of my two companies. So I take the acquiring company, Disney, and I compute the unlevered beta. So I'm doing exactly what I did with my, with, with my earlier example of unlevering the regression betas. That 0.64 reflects a 36% tax rate. So let's say they both have a 36% marginal tax rate. So it's one minus the tax rate. So I take the regression, the equity beta, I unlever it, and I come up with an unlevered beta 1.08 for Disney and an unlevered beta of 0.93 for Cap City. So let me pause right there. What's the unlevered beta telling me? It's giving me the beta, the business risk in the two companies. We've already computed the values of the two businesses. Not the equity, but the values of the two businesses, basically by adding equity and debt. I take a weighted average of those two unlevered betas. I get an unlevered beta for the combined company of 1.03. So basically, by combining these two companies, I'm going to create a combined company, which has an unlevered beta 1.03. Couple of things to remember here. The weights reflect the entire firm, not just the equity, because I'm looking at unlevered betas, which reflect the whole business. And it's a weighted average. You say, what about synergies? What about, no, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, the weights are the weights, right? So whatever you have has to show up in the market values. So all those side, the, the, the distractions, put them aside. Because when you get to the cash flows, I'll let you play with all those things. But the unlevered beta will be a weighted average of those two numbers. Any questions on this step? So if I gave you any merger that's in the news, you should be able to get all of that information. Right? The equity beta is this basically a regression beta, if you trust the regression. The debt and equity should be, in, these are market values. Market cap is the equity. The debt, you can use book debt if you're in a hurry. Everything in here is public information. You should be able to take it and do it for any company. You had a question, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's one minus the tax rate. I used the 36% tax rate. Remember the one minus C, so I should be more explicit. It's one minus 0.36, so that's what it is. So I have the unlevered beta for the combined company. Now I can ask the question. Do you have a question too? Yeah. yeah. Where's the 5.341? Oh, that actually is just the sum of the 31.1 plus the 19. The sum has to add up to the value of the two companies. So just remember, the weights have to add up to one. So I'm just taking the two numbers and weighting them. Any other questions? Now I can ask the question, how did Disney fund this deal? And I'll give you the actual financing they use. Disney chose, in the, no, chose to borrow $10 billion to buy cap cities. But I'm going to start with an easier solution. Let's assume that Disney had used all equity to fund this deal. And usually the way this works is 
when you want to use all equity, you do a share deal. Basically, you pay, you give Cap City shareholders shares in Disney in return for Cap. When you do an acquisition, the first thing to remember is the target company ceases to exist. It's gone, right? It becomes part of Disney. The Cap City shares are going to get replaced with something. And the question I have to answer is, what are they going to get replaced? In the first scenario, I assume that Disney assumes Cap City's debt. It's only a tiny amount, and they take on the debt. And they're going to issue all equity to fund the deal. So the equity value for the company will jump by $18.5 billion. You see where the $18.5 billion came from? That's a market value of equity at Cap Cities. You now have to issue $18.5 billion of your equity to replace it. So Disney's equity is going to jump by 18 and a half. So debt is $3.8 billion. Equity is $49 billion. The debt to equity ratio I'd get with those numbers would be 7.66% which if I take my unlevered beta and use the same tax rate, gives me a levered beta 1.08. So they used all equity to fund the deal. Their debt to equity ratio is going to drop. Why? Because they've issued this immense amount of equity. And the beta that I'm going to get for the combined company is going to reflect the fact that they haven't added to their debt load. What they actually did was borrow 10 billion. If you borrow 10 billion, Remember, you still have to pay $18.5 billion. The remaining $8.5 billion has to come from equity. So here's how the calculation will change. My debt increases by $10 billion. That's a new debt that they've issued. My equity increases by only $8.5 billion because that's the extra equity you now have to issue to cover the rest. My debt to equity ratio is going to be much higher, 35%. And my levered beta is going to be 1.25. I'm going to. So you can already see, I can, if I give you the debt and equity mix, you should be able to take any acquisition and say, this is what the beta will be after the deal. So I'm going to leave you with an exercise, and I'll send you the solution tomorrow, of if this deal had been all debt funded. Remember, we looked at all equity. We have looked at part debt and part equity. If it had been all debt funded, the entire $18.5 billion, I want you to compute what the levered beta for Disney would be after the transaction. So you don't have to wait 24 hours, work it out. In 24 hours, I'll send you the email with the actual answer. You can check to see whether you got it. But I want you to get comfortable with this process, because it's, a, it's actually a simple process. You repeat it over. There's nothing you have to do differently if I gave you a different merger. You still have to start with that information. Unlever first, take the weighted average, then look at the way the deal is funded, and you can come up with the beta for the combined company after the deal. Okay. Any questions on? dealing with acquisitions. So now I'm going to use this concept to get rid of that regression beta I got for Disney. If you remember, I ran the regression for Disney and I came up with the beta 1.25. Pure coincidence that it can't, turned out to be the beta that I got there. But then I hemmed in hard and said, I don't trust this number. It's backward looking. It's noisy. I was digging a hole for regression betas, and I hopefully have buried a regression beta. But I need to replace it with something. And I'm going to use what I just described, the process, to come up with a beta for Disney. Remember, betas are weighted averages. If I can somehow give you the values of the businesses I'm in and the unlevered betas of being in that business, you should be able to build up to a beta for your company. So we're going to play a little game. I want somebody here to start a business. So you, why don't you start a company? Be in any two businesses you want. Any two you want. How about vaping and casinos? OK. OK, that's a, you know, so we're, we're, she's entered, she has a company. She's part vaping, part casinos. I'll be back tomorrow. Here's what I do. I go back to my office. I find every publicly traded casino company I can in the world. Say I find 100. I look for vaping companies, but they're not that much. But vaping is just tobacco under a more polite you know, scan. So I'm going to. We collect 100 tobacco. I know that those of you who are vapors say, that's not true. I don't, that's, I'm not a tobacco smoker. And you know what? You can operate under whatever illusions you want, and I will operate under whatever illusions I want. So I find 100 tobacco companies. They're all publicly traded. So what can I get for each of the casino companies? I can get a beta for each of the 100 casino companies. I get the 100 betas. I take a simple average. No game playing. I take the 100 casino companies. I take a simple average. These are all regression betas, right? So what do we say about regression betas? Are they levered or unlevered? Levered, and they reflect the debt to equity ratio of tobacco companies and casino companies. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to unlever the two betas, just like I did for Disney and for them. 
And I'm going to end up with an unlevered bait of being in tobacco and an unlevered bait of being in vaping. Then I come back to you. You thought you were off the hook, but not quite yet. So how much value do you get from the two businesses? And your reaction will be, I don't know how much value I get, but I can tell you how much revenues I get. I get 70% from casinos, 30% from vaping. It's not perfect, it's not a preferred value, but I can take what I can take. So I take the 70 and 30 and I take a weighted average of my two unlevered baits. I end up with an unlevered bait of your company. Then I ask you a final question. How much debt do you have? And if you say, no, I don't have any debt, I'm done, right? Because the unlevered beta would be a levered beta. But if you do have debt, then I'm going to compute a debt to equity ratio for you. And I'm going to use that debt to equity ratio to come up with a levered beta for your company. I call this a bottom up beta. You can call it whatever you want. But basically, I'm building up to a beta from the businesses you're in. You think, what if I'm in a single business? My life got really easy. I'll just compute the beta for that one business, give it 100% weight. Now, why am I doing all of this? Because I don't like regression betas, right? Where did I get the 100 casino company betas? I got them from regressions. All I've done is replace one regression beta with an average of 100. So what's the big deal? Why is it better to use an average of 100 betas than one beta? Remember the law of large numbers in statistics? When, we, when I showed you the regression beta for Disney, one of the things that concerned me was the big standard error, right? When I use one regression beta, the standard error is going to be large. But I have 100 regression betas all with that same standard error. And I take the average. Something magical happens. The average is 10 times more precise. I never got this in my statistics class. How do you take 100 crappy numbers, average them out, and tell me the average is precise? I think I get it now. You know what a large standard error means? Each individual regression beta is off. Some are overestimated. Some are underestimated, right? When I average, what do I do? I average out my mistakes. It's a simple application of the law of large numbers. An average of 100 betas is going to be more precise than any individual company's regression. And there's another bonus. Let's say you entered the vaping business just last month. If I ran a regression on your stock, I would never catch that, right? Because I'm going back five years. But since I picked the weights, I can reflect the businesses you're in. I can go further. I can ask you, what other businesses do you plan to be in? You say, oh, I'm already in the sin business. Might as well add alcohol to it. And how about cannabis on the side? In which case, I take the betas of those two businesses, and I can tell you what your beta will be going forward. I have control of your beta. It's no longer a number coming from Bloomberg or a regression. It's a number that reflects your choices. And that's a much healthier place to be when you think about betas and just looking up a Bloomberg beta for your company. So any questions about the process? Because now I'm going to take that process and apply it to Disney. Okay? Now life gets a little messier, right? Because I have to ask Disney the same questions I asked her, which is what businesses are you in? And luckily, Disney doesn't even have to answer. It's in their 10K in their annual report. They break themselves down into five businesses, or they broke themselves down into five businesses. One of these businesses is now gone, and there's a new business in its place. I'm going to ask you the, how the mix has changed. So here's the breakdown. First is media networks. That's what they call their broadcasting business. What's in there? ABC. In fact, the, the, the ironic thing about the ABC acquisition is when they bought e ABC, ESPN was just thrown into the deal as an add-on. Who's going to watch sports 24 hours a day? That's crazy. And of course, ESPN became the elephant in the room. It became the cash flow driver for Disney as a company. So it is ABC, it has ESPN, it has Disney Cable. It also has a variety of other broadcasting ventures that they bought. They have an Indian TV station that they talk, took, a, took a piece of. They're all in the broadcasting business. So this was 2013. There's no streaming. I'm going to come back and ask you where we would put streaming now. But that was the broadcasting business. Then parks and resorts. This should be an easy one, right? What's in there? Disney World, Disneyland. Euro Disney, Tokyo Disney. But remember, Euro Disney and Tokyo Disney are a very different setup than Disney World and Disneyland. Disney World and Disneyland, Disney actually runs it, basically owns it. 
Euro Disney and Tokyo Disney, they actually have a management contract where they get, you're saying, why does that matter? Their income stream from those businesses are different because some of the income takes the form of a management stream. Disney Shanghai had just opened, so its revenues were kind of negligible now. But if you think about updating it today, you'd have Disney Hong Kong, Disney Shanghai, you'd have much more, more Asia focused, but at that time it was basically Euro Disney, Tokyo Disney, Disney World and Disneyland. But they also threw in a couple of other things here to kind of make your life a little messy. Those cruise ships that they own are treated as part of the theme park business. Why? Because let's face it, the only reason you go on a Disney cruise ship is because you want to see Mickey. Now, of course, nobody wants to go on a cruise ship, even if Mickey's on. <laughs> but this is an extension of the theme park business, so they threw it into the cruise. So what I'm trying to say is things get messy for companies because sometimes your business is, where do I put that? And they put it in the theme park business. Then you have studio entertainment. What's in there? That's a movie business. So let's start old. The part of Disney movie business that's been around forever is, of course, the Disney animated movies. And now those animated movies are becoming live action movies. Cinderella is already a human form. So basically, they're all the Disney movies. On top of that, you, know, you have Pixar, you have Marvel. You used to have a, a problematic company in here. Luckily, they sold it before it became a huge problem, which is Weinstein's. You know, they, and so they're saying, thank you, God, for not making, us, you know, making it part of the company anymore. So it's all the pieces of the movie business. Studio. Then they have consumer products. What are those? This is the stuff you buy, right? And many of you, when you were younger, bought the stuff. Disney is a master at pretty much merchandising everything. It's a stuff guy, it's a plastic guy, it's the, the software, it's all the stuff. The, this business has changed at Disney. They used to actually make this stuff and sell it. Now they license it. It's become almost entirely a licensing business because they don't want to you know, take any of the issues. There used to be a Disney retail, but that's now disappeared because across the world, Disney is shuttering its Disney stores. There are a few left which turn out to be more like advertising. Times Square, for instance, they still have that store left. But they used to have almost 600 stores. Most of them are shut down. And in 2013, Disney had a business called Disney Interactive. This was going to create games for smartphones and apps. It's the interactive business. So five businesses, I'm taking Disney at their word, lots of shades of gray here, but I'm saying, look, I can't second guess them. They gave me a bunch of information on each of these businesses. This is something you can look for for your company. Some companies are really good about what they tell you by business. Disney, for instance, gives you revenues, operating income, depreciation. I mean, basically all these pieces. There are other companies where you will see only revenues broken down. Because IFRS doesn't require that every element of your financials be broken down. Disney's broken down their company into five businesses. So at least I'm going to lay out the task I'm going to face on Wednesday when I come back. What do I need to do to compute a bottom-up beta for Disney? Take me step through step. What, what, what's the first step? Okay. Think of the example that I gave. I have to find the unlevered betas. And already you can see I'll have to make some choices, right? On broadcasting and movies. So I have to decide whether I want to save it just US or global what to include in each business, so I have to include, no. So I get an unlevered beta. What's the second thing I need to do? I need to get a value for each business. They've given me revenues, I can take the revenues themselves, but let's face it, a dollar of revenues in the movie business and a dollar of revenues in the theme park business don't deliver the same margins. If I can somehow convert the revenues into value, that'll be better. And once I get that, I'm going to have values for the five businesses. Then what do I do? I take a weighted average, and I'm going to come up with an unlevered beta for Disney that reflects the business it's in. What's the last step? I need to know how much debt and equity Disney has. The equity should be easy, right? It's a publicly traded company. I can look up the market cap. The debt will be a little messier, and we've got to come back and talk. They'll give me the book value of debt. Some of it is traded. A lot of it is not. I'll go through the game of converting the book debt to market debt. And when I'm done, here's what I'm going to have. I'm going to have a levered beta for Disney. And as a bonus, you know what, I, what else I'm going to have? I'm going to have a levered beta for each of the five businesses the company's in. And I'm going to argue that if you're running a multi-business company like Disney, you need both those numbers to make your... Because what's the end game here? What do I want? I want a hurdle rate that I can use to decide whether to open the next theme park, whether to make the next Avengers movie. 
whether to expand Disney streaming, right? And I'm going to argue that without knowing the betas of the businesses, each of the businesses separately, I cannot make those choices. So on Wednesday, I'm going to go through the process. I'm going to tell you it's going to be a little painful because numbers are going to pile up. What I would strongly recommend if you're worried about that is to read ahead on it. So when you come to class, if you have issues on the process, you at least know, at, where, you know what part of it is giving you trouble. So. Facebook is getting punished with a high P ratio? No, so say for example the uh, company in so the sector in an average has like it's 30 not percent. Right. There's absolutely no correlation okay. between debt and punishment. Because I was thinking that the equity it, would make more usually if, if there is some level of debt, like maybe 20 percent there. It depends on whether you can afford it. In fact, if you, if you don't have a tax advantage, it doesn't matter what yeah, the equity is. But if you do have a tax advantage, it might, but it's going to be offset, at least for many firms, by, by a distress cost of credit. So if we get to the second section, we ask what's the right mix of debt and equity. That's exactly the question we're going to address. Is are there some companies with zero debt that should take on more? The answer is yes. Are there some companies with zero debt that should do absolutely nothing? The answer is absolutely yes. Are there some companies with a lot of debt that should have zero debt? The answer is yes to that as well. So it is it will depend on the companies, where it is in the life cycle, what income it's producing, whether it can keep it. It's all the fundamentals. The sector might play a role, but it's really about the company's capacity to carry debt and the tax advantage. Okay. Yeah. There's an entertainment software. Just yeah, use the entertainment software. Entertainment software. So, no way to advertise the seller. They don't sell, I mean, they, they, all the software is for the game, right? There's no software they sell separately. Right? So, any software they have is basically to serve the gaming business. Yeah. The content is game, gaming as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Any part of the world you sell, I mean, it might matter less when you sell them in Germany to show up in your country risk premium, right? You sell to safe parts of the world, you know, it's going to be less, less risky. So. Just use the weighted average. Well, Lambda will be a nightmare because you have to do a Lambda for each country. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, your evaluation is well. Who you doing? Uh, Monster. Monster. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Hey, how are you? Yeah. I have these, uh, I have these, uh, I have these, and if I like, wipe my ass on TNC. As I said, it's the audience. Yeah. 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 And most people, and 99% of people are not, but the reality is there'll be that one person cheap. And I can try, I can punish the entire class to keep that 1% down. But I don't think that they have to be rested. Uh, but I, you know, I want people to be aware that because I'm doing so many things, there will be somebody who violates the rules. And I, you know, I have to make that trade off. As do I want to create a rule system where I have 40 A's wandering up and down, and nobody's allowed to open anything physical? And I try to turn. In fact, there's some faculty trying to get Wi-Fi turned off entirely for rooms because. And I think it's a hopeless exercise, because how do I get you to not have cell service on your phone? Do I ask everybody to turn in their smartphone? I mean, it's been a nightmare. And for me, so it's And I think, for, as I said, understand. for 99 or 100, now my guess is there'll be two people in this class who will cheat. The nature of human beings. There are a couple of people who are sociopaths, and, and you know, because you're an MBA class, doesn't mean you're not a so There'll be a couple of sociopaths who will cheat. And guess what? No matter what system I set up, they're going to find a way to cheat. So I absolutely so sorry.
Yeah, because I was planning on like printing out things There are enough the rainforests in Brazil are already under salt. The last thing I wanted to do is add to that by printing okay. off more and stuff. And the TAs all know that too. Right? There's only one TA and one group, so they should add that. Okay, thank you. Okay. That'll be my nightmare. If I show up and they're like, no, you can't. I'm like, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell them, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Somebody else had a scavenger hunt, but they had to make a